Questions one to seven. You've got a whiteboard. Have a go at putting your answers down to these. You don't need to write the questions out. You don't need to make a record of this. This is just to get you used to practicing answering the questions on these gels. Five minutes. Mm -hmm. you, know, like, you said one was the longest, one was the shortest. Why was it like that? The, the, the biggest the piece of DNA, yeah. the least distance it's moved, because this gel is like, a, we call it a molecular sieve. It's got lots of little holes in it. But the biggest piece of DNA, as, as they're being pulled through the gel because they're attracted to that positive end and it's negatively charged, as it's being pulled through the, the gel, it gets stuck by that mesh work that was basically within that jelly. And so it stops, it doesn't go any further. But if you've got a small piece of DNA, it's able to pass through those holes really easily and so get all the way to the end. So the biggest, so the, the, not the length of the black band doesn't tell you anything, it's the position it has on the gel. So the least distance it moves, the bigger, the bigger the DNA fragment is. It's a bit like, if you think about chromatography, if you imagine chromatography that's going upwards, the smallest, molecules are able to pass right the way to the top aren't they where the biggest ones are always at the bottom so this is the same you know this is the same if you if you imagine this gel down sort of sat down on your desk the the, the least distance they move the bigger they are and then the smaller ones go all the way through the, it moves because of the electrical current running through it but it's it's pulled because of the positive charge on the other side that's pulling the dna through all right which samples produce the lightest DNA fragments? So you can say lightest, or you can also say shortest in length. You know, either of those are fine. So, come on then, uh, Ashlyn. Two and four. Two and four, good. Oh, well, I'm including one in there, but it doesn't matter. That's a marker lane, so I'll just include it in there. How many nucleotides are there in the lightest fragment then? Uh, Jake? Yeah, one thousand. 1,000 in the lightest ones. Which samples produce the heaviest DNA fragment? Go on, Rachel. Uh, three and five. Yeah, three and five. How many nucleotides are there in there? Carry on, Rachel. Uh, 11,000, 11, well done. Which sample produced six fragments? Come on, Emily. Three. Yeah, number three. Which samples produced identical fragments? Um, Heather? Two and four. Two and four. And what's the total size of all the fragments producing sample for Matthew? 16,000. 16, well done. Very good. Right, so we understand. Gene probes are used for quite a few different things. We use gene probes when we're trying to identify if a patient who comes into a hospital has a genetic disorder. So we can use gene probes to... to not only identify if they've got a genetic disorder, but maybe as a parent, or if you're planning to be a parent, if you want to decipher if you have got or carry a genetic disorder, and you want to therefore make decisions about you know, whether you want to have children or not, then gene probes will help you within that. And that forms a part of something called genetic screening. And we can be screened for all sorts of different things. Before we get into it, this links very heavily with a topic we did, uh, an area we did in topic four. Do you remember DNA hybridization? You all look a little bit blank. So in topic four, we were looking for methods to see how alike organisms were from different species. Do you remember? Yeah. What, was, what was the purpose of it? What was it there to see? Yeah, it's to look at the, our evolutionary history, our shared evolutionary history with other organisms, and to see whether we had a common ancestor.